everybody, Alex Machakis here, coming to you guys live from the lovely cutting room of Mr. Ground Studios here in Dallas, Texas. And it's time for another lesson of the month. And uh, this month we're going to be checking out the great Gary Clark Jr. and his cover of Come Together, a song that was originally written by the Beatles. Gary has his own take on it. He did it a couple years for the uh, Justice League movie. And if you haven't heard the cover, I really recommend you check it out. It's a really great song. I really dig the groove. Gary worked, I believe, with a DJ when he was making the song. So there's a really cool... The way the drums go with the guitar is very interesting. It's really cool. So let's get into it. Uh, we got a simple riff here. It goes like this. see I had to stop on quite a bit of pedals to kind of get the level of saturation and gain I'm looking for when I'm playing with this song. Uh, Gary, before we even get into how you, you should approach the song with the tuning and the technique and the bending and the vibrato to get your approach like Gary, another part of being inspired while you're playing the guitar is kind of getting the sound you hear in your head. And if you can get that to come out of the amp, I find I play like 25% better. <laughs> Sometimes 100% better. I, I, I shoot for 25%, but, I, you know, I feel like that's achievable. <laughs> um, but, you know, getting the sound can really take you to another place when you're playing guitar. So to get Gary's sound, one uh, really com good component is to pick a good guitar. Uh, Gary is a big fan of P90 pickups. In fact, he has a g brand new Gibson SG with three P90s just like this. Uh, I don't have one of those guitars, but what I do have is my old Gibson Les Paul Special. Uh, this is a really cool guitar from the, uh, I think this is a 98. So this is about a 20 year old Gibson Les Paul Special. Uh, straight from the factory, nothing special. Uh, Grover tuners, P90s, four volume knobs, mahogany body, no binding, decent frets. Uh, it, this is one of the guitars that has the slender neck. It's not a big 50s neck. It's a little bit slender. Uh, doesn't bother me, so that's what I'm using today for this lesson. I think that's a big part of getting the sound. P90s is kind of like a much more growly single coil pickup. You don't get really as much hum like you would a Stratocaster going through a clean amp, but as you can hear, I am getting hum from just how much gain I'm using when I'm using the pedals. So for pedals, Gary uh, uses a full-tone fuzz face. It's the Octafuzz. It's a combination of a fuzz face and an Octavia in the same box. Uh, I kind of went through a few pedals. I really like my fuzz face. That's what I ended up using for this recording. Uh, if you can get a, a, a Dunlop fuzz face, that'll get you pretty close. If you want to get like spot on, get an Analog Man NKT-275, the Red Dot Germanium NKT-275s. And that'll make a big difference in your overall sound, I think. Uh, I think that one works better from guitar to guitar. But I ended up uh, also going to the, uh, to kind of push it, the fuzz a little more, going through a, uh, an analog man king of tone. I'm going through the red gain side. Uh, I think that that's voiced a little darker on that side of the pedal with the, how I have the EQ. So I think that goes well with my amplifier. And, uh, I'm also using my, I, I, I've decided to try, I know I, every time I make a video, I'm always using some cool vintage amplifier in the studio, but I wanted to show off, hey, that you can get a brand new amp at the store, and if you know how to play and you practice, you can sound absolutely incredible. You know, uh, I love vintage amps, I love collecting amps, I feel like the extra bit of mojo I get from buying a vintage piece sometimes, just because I know I'm playing the same gear as what my heroes use. I feel like that can inspire me to take my playing to another level. But it doesn't mean if you feel like you're getting um, outpriced from vintage gear, should you just give up and not play guitar. That's not the point. Fender amplifiers that you can buy at the store right now are really absolutely fantastic. Uh, and today I'm using a 68 Fender Drip Edge uh, reissue deluxe reverb. But this is the special edition one where one half of the deluxe reverb is a standard like you know blackface deluxe reverb with uh, reverb has that has that sound if you want to go for that 
but where the normal channel would be on a traditional deluxe reverb, I normally use that channel for a little more distortion. I find on my old 66, it breaks up faster if I go through the normal channel. But on the one in here that's really cool is that side's more like a Fender basement. So I ended up liking the basement side today for Gary Clark Jr. kind of sound uh, compared to the traditional deluxe reverb side on the amp. But you know, the, the traditional deluxe reverb side sounds awesome too. I just felt like I was able to get just a little bit more low end, like what a basement's known for. So uh, with the 12-inch speaker and that deluxe, I thought that sounded really good. So you can snag one of those amps, I think new, they're like, you know, just over a thousand dollars. But if you know, I see these pop up on Craigslist all the time. Um, you can get them for at least half that if you look. It's a great amp. So that's what I'm using today. Old Gibson Les Paul Special, Fuzz Face, King of Tone, into the uh, Deluxe Reverb over there. Sometimes I find myself wanting to kick on some kind of an Octavia. Today I'm using a uh, Prescription Electronics Cobb, C-O-B pedal. Uh, and I think sometimes that sounds really cool. So I might, if I was going to play the song live, you know, switch between my fuzz face or the Octavia, maybe for certain parts of the song. Uh, but that's my overall feel for what I'm doing. So let's kind of get here, you know, get the tuning aspect down when you're going to play this song. The big thing to get the sound, Gary's sound sounds so much deeper and low than maybe a traditional guitar. And that's because Gary has uh, chosen to use what's called a drop D tuning. Uh, the interesting thing about the guitar, if you've never experimented with alternate tunings, is you don't have to just accept standard as the, you know, the end-all be-all of playing guitar. So if I'm going to go into drop D, what I'm going to do is go to this low E string here, and I'm going to tune that note. Instead of E, I'm going to lower the pitch on the tuner, on the tuning key, all the way down to a whole step, to a low D. And that gets a really cool kind of low drony effect. Uh, it's a technique used in a lot of grunge bands in the 90s, which I know Gary was a fan of, like Nirvana, Soundgarden, Pearl Jam. Uh, but you can also hear Drop D. Uh, I think the first time I ever heard Drop D was the godfather of grunge himself, Neil Young. Uh, so it's been around a long time, and it's a great trick to make riffs sound fatter, you know, with more distortion, more thunderous lows, without having to change your amp settings. You can just lower the low E string down to a D. So for the tuning, what you're going to get is if I go from the low E string down, it's going to be D for my, my low string. Tune that down to a D. Going to go to, and then everything else stays the same. So I have A, D, G string, B string, and then I leave my high E string the same. So the only note I'm changing is this low string going into drop D. So that gives you a really cool sound. You know, you get this kind of uh, Black Sabbath-y kind of chuggy thing that's really cool. You can make power chords uh, by just going with one finger. So sometimes when you want to make a riff sound really thunderous, you can just add in that low string and the chord will just be there and it's one finger. So you get a more riffy approach because you're playing chords like you would a blues scale or a pentatonic scale uh, with single notes. So you can get kind of this, you know. guitar sounds tonight. Uh, so that's kind of how I'm getting my tone. Uh, I took you through the guitar, took you through the pedals, took you through the uh, amplifier. I have the amp cranked. That's my last tip. I have it on about like, you know, at least eight and a half, almost nine on the basement side. So it's, it's really into massive distortion. But that's how you get these fuzz pedals and these dirt boxes using a pedal board to push that amp into a real fat, thick, you know, kind of singing uh, tone. So let, uh, let's get into the riff, guys. If you want to start practicing along for your uh, final tempo, your goal on a metronome should be 80 beats per minute. Uh, I found myself, if I was learning this, you know, it took me probably a, uh, a little bit kind of playing with the record for me to get it. But uh, I would say most people start at like 50. And if 50 is too slow, work your way up to 60 beats per minute and start building your way up the track once you get these notes down. So we're going to learn the uh, riff. We tuned our... Uh, Guitar down to drop D. 
We're gonna dive into this song now. Gary kind of reimagined George Harrison's iconic guitar line and the Beatles' original come together, and in this, you know, hip hop kind of inspired guitar track, it's really fantastic. So we're gonna start out. Uh, the scale you need to know to really kind of understand what's going on in this song is gonna be a D minor pentatonic scale. If you don't remember your pentatonic scale, that's the one flat third fourth fifth flat seventh one scale. So in the key of D, that'd be D F. G, A, C, D. Uh, this whole song kind of revolves around the D minor pentatonic, this riff does. So what we're going to do is dive into the main part of the riff, and then we're going to kind of break apart the intervals so you understand how to maybe construct a riff of your own in D minor if you're going after Gary's feel writing your own song. So uh, let's check it out here. Uh, I got all my pedals on, so we're going to start out by going... So I'm going to go... Here we go, guys. Let's just dive right into it. So I'm going to go open D my new low D string, I'm going to pick that twice. And think of when you do that as, you know, picking up your drone note that you're getting from your guitar. That's what establishing this low D does, tonic-wise, right? Now I'm going to take my index finger and go over to the third fret of my low D string now. And I'm going to chromatically walk up. I'm going to go 3rd fret, 4th fret, 5th fret. That's going to be going F, the minor 3rd, the flat 3rd, going to the F sharp, the major 3rd. Or if you want to just think of chromatically going F to G. You know, going from your flat 3rd to your 4th. And you kind of want that F and F sharp on the 3rd and 4th fret to be a pickup. Boom, boom, ba -da -da. So it's almost like a slur through if you would imagine a horn, right? So my last three parts of the notes, uh, I'm going to go open D twice, index, go on the third fret of my low D string chromatically, go four to five. My next note, I'm going to skip over this A string and land on the third fret of my D string. Okay, this is going to land me back on my flat third. And then I'm going to resolve the riff on a D, on the fifth fret of my A string. So the whole thing together. So if I was going to speed it up, it'd be... you know, go up. I kind of like going chromatically instead of the slide. I think it's just a little bit, you can get it a little bit more stylish. So, next part of the riff, uh, he kind of repeats, Gary repeats himself with a low D, establishes the root of the riff again. And I do that chromatic thing again, third fret, low D string, fourth fret, low D string, fifth fret, so. Then I'm going to go back up to my flat third, the F on the third fret, and I'm going to bend that a little, if you can give it just a hair, hairline bend, go up to the fifth fret on my D string, back down to the third fret on my A string, back to the D note on the fifth fret of my A string, so I'm going to go D, D, F, F sharp, G, or 3, 4, 5 on the uh, low D string. Skip over to that D, uh, higher D string in the middle here. Go up to the 5th fret on your D string. There's your G. Back to your flat 7th to C. Over to your 5th fret, which is your D. So, that's kind of the theme. Uh, 
if you wanted to just loop those two things, you certainly could, you know. Uh, but he kind of loops it twice, so you'd play the, the A riff, which is this. And then you'd go to the B riff, which is the second one. He's going to loop back to that A riff for sequence. And then to finish it, he has a really cool turnaround lick that ends up playing a lot heavily on the A, the fifth note of your blues scale. This is kind of cool. It shows that come together is a little bit blues based where you're going to end and turn around on your five to get back to the one on D. So you're going to end up going uh, open D, fifth fret on the D string here, but I'm going to bend it. Pull it back down to its original note on the fifth fret. Down to the third fret on the same string. So again, that's. And then resolve it on the D. even lower D now on the low string and it gets this awesome way to finish the riff. It gives you a heaviness, almost like a kick drum, you know? Ba 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 da ba 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 da ba It's a really hip way to finish the riff out. So if you want to think of another way to think of your scale here so if you want to think of another way to check out your scale here, what's really a cool way to analyze the riff is to think of theory-wise, use your scale numbers on the blues scale. Again, that's your one, flat third, fourth, fifth, flat seventh, and one. In this case, for the key of D, it'd be D, F, G, A, C, D. So it, all of these notes derive from that scale. So once you learn it in one place, so like if you learn this riff here, you can learn it in other places on the guitar in D and start establishing, hey, there's one way to play it here, one way here, one way here, one way here. And you start kind of, you know, at this point, stop blocking yourself in from a very small part of the fretboard because it's the same scale that's being repeated all over the guitar. What you have to do is start looking for it to recognize where it is. Once your ear can recognize where it is, you're just going to be playing in D minor everywhere you go. So this is a great exercise. Uh, so my first lick here. All right, let's look at the chords real quick. So I don't have the chords barred out, but I feel like it's really easy to follow along. The main part of the Beatles song is in D minor. You can play a D minor power chord by strumming the bottom or top three strings of your guitar, the low D, the A, and the D. <laughs> So go through all the Beatles stuff right there. It'll change when it changes. You hear. What's happening there is you want to climb up to your seventh fret. So I'm in D. So I got D F G A. That's my fifth. Then I'm gonna climb down to my G, my fourth, and turn it around just like a blues. So I'm going five, four, one. into your riff. Sometimes when he goes to the chorus, it's a little bit different. Uh, that's when you climb up to your ninth fret. You're going to be going to your six here. Going down to your four, which is at the fifth fret, your four chord, that's a G. Up to your five, that's an A. And then back to your riff. So let's kind of analyze now uh, a little part of our main riff of Come Together. We're going to start checking it out, you know, what I like to call uh, diatonically or using your pentatonic scale or diatonic major scale to identify intervals 
in a riff or in a, in a chord so you can start looking for patterns. And a cool part about thinking this way, you know, theory, all theory does on the guitar is show you where you can go. You get to make the choices of where you want to leave. You know, if you don't want to go somewhere with theory wise, you don't have to. But if I'm wanting to kind of take a look at how Gary here is constructing a riff so I can write a song of my own that takes that feel to maybe another level, or, or to where I want to take my song with, you know, my creativity or, or, you know, maybe I just want that guitar sound or maybe I like the tempo of the track and that's, that's making me feel a certain way when I want to create. You know, there's a lot of what you can take here. But for electric guitarists, a lot of times with Gary Clark Jr., we always want to do what the soloing is. So looking for patterns, if you know the scale this way, can help you kind of, uh, maybe you go, ah, Gary's leaning very heavily on that flat third and resolving on that flat seventh to resolve it back to D. Hmm, maybe that's something I should do too. <laughs> so, uh, let's check it out here. Going back to this riff, the main part, it starts on D. So the way I like to think of it, I'm gonna start a riff. I want my riff to start to, to say, hey, if I'm in the key of D, I'm giving you a D note. I'm giving you the bass line. I'm letting your ear develop what is the key for the song. It's very rare to not start on the starting chord or the, of the key or the starting note of the key when you start a song because you want to establish that key as the bass line, you know? You, if I started on the fourth, which is a very unusual thing to do, or the third, and then went into the one and started the song, people would be like, what the hell is that? They want, your, your ear is trained, you start on the one, you know? The only successful pop song, as far as I'm ever concerned, that that was the only one to break this rule was the Beatles. The only one to break this rule would have been like, you know, the Beatles. George Harrison on, uh, what was it, uh, Hard Day's Night. And he does the Rickenbacker chord, or the Gretsch chord, or whichever guitar he's using at the time. And uh, he did not start on the one. But that song, it doesn't matter, you go along. Most people can't do that. So I recommend starting your riff on the one if you're gonna write this. So in this case, that's D. So we got D, right? Now I gotta go somewhere. I gotta take my, my, where can I go? What are my available notes? Well, hey, I can play a D, I can play an F, I can play a G, I can play an A, I can play a C, and I can go to a higher D. Well, are there anything else? Well, yeah, you know, I, I guess if I wanted to be hip, I could throw in the, I could throw in a major third and go back to the minor third to be with the bend to be really cool. Uh, I could go to the minor second. I could, I guess I could go to a six. I don't know why you want to, but you could. <laughs> but you know, I gotta go somewhere. So the the most common place to go somewhere if you're gonna play blues is usually after a root note. You're gonna go to that flat third. So that's what we see Gary do here. He has his low D, lands on that flat third, that F. Now he's gonna climb up to the fourth, land on the flat third again with a slight bend to build some tension, and go back down to a D to the root. So if you notice, that flat third, that bluesy note, that's what you're hearing when I'm hanging on it, you know, or I'm, I'm sliding through it. That's what makes something give that bluesy feel. You know, so think about that flat third, wherever that you find that on the guitar, okay? Think about that as, hey, to add tension and to add drama to my music, if I keep going back on it and back and forth between that and the root, how the, t the amount of time I take to get back to that root note, the D, man, it, it, you can build a lot of tension and build a lot of drama as a soloist just doing that. If you think of any of our heroes, Gary Clark Jr., Hendrix, B.B. King, Doyle Bramall, Two, Stevie Ray Vaughan, uh, David Gilmore, uh, tons of guitarists do this so well. So you really want to take advantage of that flat third wherever you can. Uh, so if we notice, when Gary's going to resolve it a second time to slightly change the riff, we see that flat third again, right? He goes D, flat third up to the fourth, back to that flat third on the D string on the third fret, but now I'm going to climb up to my high fourth, or my higher fourth, mid octave fourth, land on that G, that fourth. Now I'm gonna, inst I could at this point, I'm on the fourth, I could just go, go back to the root, right? But we don't, Gary doesn't do that here. And, and it adds again a bit more tension and a bit more drama instead of going, hey, that's all my bend is. 
I'm gonna go back down to my flat seventh on the C. Back up to that root. So you get instead of, you get this. That, oh, there you go. Now that riff's slinky. It wasn't slinky if I just went third, fourth root. You gotta get back to that C. Woo! So, Cool, that's, that's most of the riff, right? So let's look at it on another level when he turns it around as to what I was referring to earlier where he lands on the A. The A note here on this lick is what defines why this is a part C or a turnaround to the other two. So you have your root again. We're establishing the song is still in D. But I'm gonna land on that fifth fret on my D string. And in this case, there's my, there's my A, okay? Because well, wait a minute. I thought previously when we pushed that note just on the fifth fret, I thought you said that's a G because I knew the third fret on that same string is an F. If that's a flat third, doesn't the fifth, F, fifth fret have to be my, my fourth G? Yes. But when you do this final lick because of the bend, it's a whole step bend. And it's actually like you're sliding up onto the seventh fret of your D string. So I could go... Same thing, but the bend gives it the style, right? And so you're because that bent note is the most prominent note of the entire phrase, we're really going on an A, our fifth, and then resolving it back to D. And that's why the riff sounds that part sounds like it's a finality. And that is why it sounds like the rip can be hypnotic because the natural thing right after we turn it around is just to loop it back around to the beginning. So that's part of, in terms of music theory, how Gary is able to build such effective hypnotic hooks with his guitar. You can too if you work at the theory so you can start thinking when you write yourself as a musician, where can I go? What can I do? I got this much. This is what I'm hearing in my head. I got this much figured out. Where are the other places I can go? So start working at it, and I promise you'll get better. So that's it for uh, another lesson of the month, guys. I'm Alex Machakis. Feel free to follow me on Instagram and on Facebook. And I'd love it if you could like and share uh, and subscribe for more videos. All right, guys. See you later. Peace.